Feather beds are scarce in America. In America, they sleep on hard mattresses, even in the winter. A steamboat ticket was a passport to a new life. Paris, 1889. 100 years had passed since the French Revolution. To commemorate the anniversary, the French erected a structure that rose over the city. The Eiffel Tower was the tribute to science, to optimism, and to the future of mankind. Throughout Western Europe, the population was growing. Cities were expanding. The middle classes, secure in their power, enjoyed the benefits of a prosperous society. The new economy developed with astonishing speed. Industrial society produced more goods for more people than ever before in history. Great wealth was created, but also great social dislocations. Men who had once worked the land now worked machinery. Jobs were sporadic and uncertain. The wages were low, the hours long. Machines took away the livelihood of artisans and craftsmen. Thousands who had prospered in the old economy were threatened by the new. The modern world seemed to bear down on them with implacable force. Those who had lost in the new economy turned their anger and frustration against those who had gained. By the 1880s, most Jews in Western Europe had become middle class. They had won their political rights. They had won a place in European society as well. A Jewish textile manufacturer wrote about his home village in Germany. At one time, there were quite a number of poor Jews in the community. Those who still remember those earlier days must acknowledge that a transformation took place before their very eyes which the new generation cannot even imagine. In Germany, France, Austria, the Jews were now above average in wealth and education. They brought their tradition of literacy and scholarship to the liberal professions, helping to shape modern law, medicine and journalism. Those who were accustomed to look down upon the Jews and to despise them were astonished by the extent of their achievements. Their new visibility was in itself an affront to their enemies. To those who hated and dreaded the rapidly changing modern world, the Jews became the symbol for everything that they feared and could not understand. By the 1880s, shrewd and opportunistic politicians recognized that resentment of Jewish success could be used as a source of political power anti-Semitism. The word was new, but the hatreds it reflected were ancient, and from those hatreds the anti-Semites created a dangerous political movement. They wrenched from the work of Darwin and other biologists whatever theories could be twisted to support the idea of a Jewish race. They blamed the Jews for the growth of industry. They blamed them for poverty and suffering. They blamed them for the modern world. In Vienna, where the Jewish community was large and prosperous, Karl Lueger ran for mayor 
on an anti-Semitic platform. He was elected over and over again. An Austrian poet described the irrational politics of the day. Politics is magic. He who knows how to summon the forces from the deep, him will they follow. By the 1890s, the forces of anti-Semitism had reached as far as these chambers of the Austrian parliament. Here in Vienna, as elsewhere, political parties sought to gain electoral support by pandering to popular anti-Semitic attitudes. And there were anti-Semites for every political persuasion. Radical anti-Semites saw the Jews as leading the forces of capitalism. Liberal anti-Semites saw them as a backward Oriental people incapable of absorption into the nations of Europe, while conservative anti-Semites saw the Jews as rootless, lacking in tradition, dangerously modern. Uh, clearly, it was not the real content of Jewish life and character that mattered to the anti-Semites. Their Jews were the creation and reflection of their own terrors, fantasies, and neuroses. To attack the Jews was to attack whatever it was that they disliked in the modern world. As the Jews strove to shed the burdens of traditional hatred and prejudice, the anti-Semites found them to be a vulnerable and politically useful target. In France, by the 1890s, the Jews had become fully integrated in the life of the nation, sharing equally in the rights and duties of citizens. It was here that one of the most notorious anti-Semitic episodes took place. In 1894, Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish captain in the French army, was accused of spying for the Germans. He was tried and convicted on forged evidence. In a public ceremony, Dreyfus was stripped of his rank, while in the crowd around him there were shouts of death to the traitor, death to the Jews. The anti-Semitic press took up the cry. What a terrible lesson, this disgraceful treason of the Jew Dreyfus. All the maneuvers of Judah are directed against the very soul of France. Dreyfus was in fact entirely innocent. He was exiled to the prison colony of Devil's Island. For four years, his case was forgotten. Then, in 1898, the writer Emile Zola published an open letter to the President of France. I will tell the truth. It is my duty to speak. My nights would be haunted by the specter of an innocent man atoning for a crime he did not commit. I accuse General Bigot of having had in his hands decisive proof of Dreyfus's innocence and of having suppressed it. I accuse General Mercier of being an accomplice. I accuse General Boisdeff of being an accomplice. I accuse the court-martial of condemning an innocent man. To many Frenchmen, Zola's attack on the generals seemed to be an attack on France itself. His article unleashed a storm. Mobs rioted in the streets of Paris. Duels were fought. Families and friendships were torn apart. All France took sides, for Dreyfus or against him. Anti-Semites throughout Europe exploited the Dreyfus affair. In Rome, the official Jesuit newspaper denounced the emancipation of the Jews. The Jews have invented the allegations of a judicial error. The real error was granting them French nationality. That law must be revoked, not only in France, but in Germany, Austria and Italy as well. Zola and his allies held their ground. In 1899, an official inquiry began. It found that the evidence against Dreyfus had indeed been forged by officers of the French army. A second court-martial again found Dreyfus guilty, 
although this time with extenuating circumstances. Dreyfus was fully cleared only in 1906. He resumed his commission and was awarded the Order of the Legion of Honor. Most Jews in France were reassured by Dreyfus's victory. They felt that they, along with Dreyfus, had won their case against the anti-Semites. Among the journalists in Paris during the Dreyfus affair was a Viennese Jew, Theodore Herzl. He came to a different conclusion. We have honestly striven everywhere to merge ourselves in the social life of surrounding communities and to preserve only the faith of our fathers. It has not been permitted to us. In countries where we have lived for centuries, we are still cried down as strangers. If the Jews could not be accepted as Europeans, then they remained a separate nation without a home. Herzl called for the creation of a Jewish state. The movement to create this state called itself Zionism after the name of a hill in Jerusalem, Mount Zion. In 1897, in Basel, Switzerland, 200 delegates from all over Europe gathered for the first World Zionist Congress. Herzl's presence electrified the Congress. The Jews who will it shall achieve their state. We shall live at last as free men on our own soil. A few Jewish settlers from Russia had already made their way to Palestine. Herzl's inspiration, the Zionist idea became a political movement. The Zionist movement had its strongest appeal in Russia, where Jews were seeking to forge a better way of life. By the end of the 19th century, many Jews in the Pale lived in cities rather than market towns. Increasing numbers worked in factories and in marginal industries. Poverty was widespread, and recurring pogroms a constant source of fear. In 1897, a group of Jewish socialists gathered in the city of Vilna to form what would be known as the Jewish Labour Bund. centuries the Jew lived like a slave. When his blood was shed, he fell like a dumb animal under the hand of the slaughterer. But the spirit of the ancient Jewish heroes has been reborn among the Jewish workers. The Bundists joined with other socialists to fight for the rights of workers. Through revolution, they hoped to cure the ills of Russian life and end the oppressive poverty of the pale. Jewish women, putting aside their traditional role, joined in the new movements in Zionism, in Bundism, joined in the struggle to reshape Jewish life. Yiddish, the ordinary speech of the Jewish masses, had never been taken seriously by educated Jews. Its combination of Hebrew characters and German dialect had seemed common and uncultivated. Now it became the vehicle of a renaissance in Jewish culture. Newspapers and journals brought the modern world into the lives of millions of Yiddish-speaking Jews.
Shakespeare, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, the world's classics were translated into Yiddish. The writers created a new literature in both Yiddish and Hebrew. Chaim Nachman Bialik, the Hebrew poet. Shimon Dubnov, the historian of the Jewish people. Mendele Mochet Sforim, the Yiddish novelist. Yehuda Leib Peretz, the Yiddish poet. Sholom Aleichem, the Yiddish writer. A Yiddish theater developed. A secular and popular culture was born based on the daily life of the Jewish people. The stream of Jewish culture and Jewish life would flow into the larger European world as the 19th century drew to a close. In the vivid urban life of Vienna, Paris, Berlin, London, and St. Petersburg, the consequences of a century of social and economic change were visible everywhere. The world was in ferment. New industries appeared as if overnight, new sciences, new art forms, new ways of life. At the beginning of the 19th century, most people had expected to live in a world very much like that of their parents. By the end of the century, everyone knew that in his own lifetime, the world would be transformed beyond recognition. Every aspect of society and of life was open to question was filled with possibilities. A generation joined enthusiastically in the exploration of the modern world. In every field of endeavor, Jews played an important role. Arthur Schnitzler, Sigmund Freud, Arnold Schoenberg, Amedeo Modigliani, Franz Kafka, Gustav Mahler, Marcel Proust, Albert Einstein. These men were Jews. They were also modern Europeans. Being Jewish no longer restricted them to a separate Jewish world. What they contributed was not to a body of Jewish culture, but to the common heritage of all Europeans. In the capitals of Europe, the arrival of the 20th century was saluted with cannons. One who heard them wrote, I listened with a kind of shiver. One knew all that the 19th century had carried away. One did not know what the 20th would bring. In March of 1912, the Princess Louise was married in Moscow. The Tsar Nicholas II and the Tsarina Alexandra led the procession with Crown Prince Alexis at their side. Following them were the princesses, Olga, Tatiana, Marie, and Anastasia. The wedding brought together the potentates and royalty of all European lands, including Franz Josef, Emperor of Austria, and Wilhelm II, Emperor of Germany. Within six years, the empires of Franz Josef and Wilhelm would be gone. Nicholas and his family would be dead. A revolution in Russia and a world war in Europe would bring an end to these last vestiges of the old political order. The Russian pale of settlement came to an end as armies marched back and forth across the region. Its populations were evacuated, its social institutions destroyed.
Jews fought as citizens of the European nations. As Germans, as Frenchmen, as Austrians, Englishmen, Russians. For the Jews, as for all others, the world of established truths was gone. A hundred years before, the ghetto, the closed community, the religious laws had formed the Jewish identity. Now each Jew was forced to discover for himself the meaning of his Jewish heritage. Now there was complex diversity in Jewish life. Each Jew would have to find his own place in a world both promising and precarious. In November 1917, after British forces gained control of Palestine, the Zionist leader Chaim Weizmann secured a pledge from the government of Great Britain. It would be known as the Balfour Declaration, after its signer, Foreign Minister Arthur Balfour. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Thirty years later, the promise of the Balfour Declaration would be fulfilled in the creation of the State of Israel. The diversity of Jewish life was now to find expression in new lands where new opportunities awaited. To many, it seemed that the greatest hope lay in a land to the west, across the Atlantic. Through this great hall of the Ellis Island Immigration Center in New York Bay passed Gentile and Jew, the poor and the dispossessed, the hungry and the disenfranchised. The beacon that drew them here was the vision of an America where a new tradition would be forged based on universal dreams of justice and equality. The prophet Isaiah had written, then justice shall dwell in the wilderness and righteousness shall abide in the fruitful field. America, they dreamed and hoped, would be that fruitful field. Great wealth was created, but also great social dislocations. Men who had once worked the land now worked machinery. Jobs were sporadic and uncertain. The wages were low, the hours long. Machines took away the livelihood of artisans and craftsmen. Thousands who had prospered in the old economy were threatened by the new. The modern world seemed to bear down on them with implacable force. Those who had lost in the new economy turned their anger and frustration against those who had gained. Leather beds are scarce in America. In America, they sleep on hard mattresses, even in the winter. A steamboat ticket was a passport to a new life. Paris, 1889. 100 years had passed since the French Revolution. To commemorate the anniversary, the French...
By the 1880s, most Jews in Western Europe had become middle class. They had won their political rights. They had won a place in European society as well. A Jewish textile manufacturer wrote about his home village in Germany. At one time, there were quite a number of poor Jews in the community. Those who still remember those earlier days must acknowledge that a transformation took place before their very eyes, which the new generation cannot even imagine. In Germany, France, Austria, the Jews were now above average in wealth and education. They brought their tradition of literacy and erected a structure that rose over the city. The Eiffel Tower was the tribute to science, to optimism, and to the future of mankind. Throughout Western Europe, the population was growing. Cities were expanding. The middle classes, secure in their power, enjoyed the benefits of a prosperous society. The new economy developed with astonishing speed. Industrial society produced more goods for more people than ever before in history. And scholarship to the liberal professions, helping to shape modern law medicine and journalism. Those who were accustomed to look down upon the Jews and to despise them were astonished by the extent of their achievements. Their new visibility was in itself an affront to their enemies. To those who hated and dreaded the rapidly changing modern world, the Jews became the symbol for everything that they feared and could not understand. By the 1880s, shrewd and opportunistic politicians recognized that resentment of Jewish success could be used as a source of political power. Anti-Semitism. The word was new, but the hatreds it reflected were ancient, and from those hatreds the anti-Semites created